Now open your question paper and look at part one. You will hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. I've just seen some statistics that show that the number of graduates taking gap years is falling steadily. That must mean that they're focusing their efforts on getting on the first rung of the career ladder as soon as possible, whatever good that does, rather than taking the chance to see something of the world before they get tied into a routine. It's a pity, really. I know some are apprehensive about what potential bosses would think. I mean, whether they'd see the gap year as a bit of a skive. It all comes down to the way it's put forward, though. If you can say what you've learnt about yourself and life while working on, say, a community project in an inhospitable mountain valley, that cuts more ice with interviewers than lying on a beach somewhere exotic. It goes without saying. And some firms think a degree isn't enough. They'd like evidence of work-related experience, though more are realising that some of the things people get involved with in voluntary work overseas are very challenging and may well turn them into more creative and dynamic staff members. I've just seen some statistics that show that the number of graduates taking gap years is falling steadily. That must mean that they're focusing their efforts on getting on the first rung of the career ladder as soon as possible, whatever good that does, rather than taking the chance to see something of the world before they get tied into a routine. It's a pity, really. I know some are apprehensive about what potential bosses would think, I mean, whether they'd see the gap year as a bit of a skive. It all comes down to the way it's put forward, though. If you can say what you've learnt about yourself and life while working on, say, a community project in an inhospitable mountain valley, that cuts more ice with interviewers than lying on a beach somewhere exotic. It goes without saying. And some firms think a degree isn't enough. They'd like evidence of work-related experience, though more are realising that some of the things people get involved with in voluntary work overseas are very challenging and may well turn them into more creative and dynamic staff members. Extract 2 Most consumers go through several stages before making a purchase. First, they recognise that they have a want or a need. The consumer compares their situation to some situation they would consider to be better, and this further stimulates their want or need. In the information search stage, the person seeks information about how this want might be met. They assess past experiences, they consult external sources of information, and start to weigh up the alternatives. But since humans have a limited ability to absorb information, we generally move on to the next stage knowing only some things about some alternatives. This behaviour is of interest to marketing professionals. They look for opportunities to try to sway consumer choices toward their organisation's products. They may try to create new desires for new products, but this is costly and risky. Making sure customers aren't frustrated in making their intended purchases by offering one-click purchasing is an innovation which has proved a winner, however. We consumers are basically lazy. Few of us apparently even bother to read specifications of updated products before making our final decision to buy. Most consumers go through several stages before making a purchase. First, they recognise that they have a want or a need. The consumer compares their situation to some situation they would consider to be better, and this further stimulates their want or need. In the information search stage, the person seeks information about how this want might be met. They assess past experiences, they consult external sources of information, and start to weigh up the alternatives. But since humans have a limited ability to absorb information, we generally move on to the next stage knowing only some things about some alternatives. This behaviour is of interest to marketing professionals. 
they look for opportunities to try to sway consumer choices toward their organization's products. They may try to create new desires for new products, but this is costly and risky. Making sure customers aren't frustrated in making their intended purchases by offering one click purchasing is an innovation which has proved a winner, however. We consumers are basically lazy. Few of us apparently even bother to read specifications of updated products before making our final decision to buy. Extract 3 What is the single most important thing you've learned about selling online? Well, you know, there are a lot of excellent competitors around and you have to stand out to get traffic to your site. Things can change and opportunities arise with little or no notice and being able to effectively handle the pace is what really helps or hinders a business. Actually, selling online involves many of the same concepts of traditional retailing using different tools and techniques. We need to remember not to get too wrapped up in the tools and techniques, but rather to clearly understand how each one supports a proven retailing concept. So what happens when it is time to grow your online business? If you've defined the next step and are attempting to grow to it, you must already have some sort of strategic plan in mind. Whatever the experts say about this being the crucial factor, you'll never get there without sufficient resources. If these aren't in place, you'll need to get creative and hit upon new backers from somewhere before moving forward. What is the single most important thing you've learned about selling online? Well, you know, there are a lot of excellent competitors around and you have to stand out to get traffic to your site. Things can change and opportunities arise with little or no notice and being able to effectively handle the pace is what really helps or hinders a business. Actually, selling online involves many of the same concepts of traditional retailing using different tools and techniques. We need to remember not to get too wrapped up in the tools and techniques but rather to clearly understand how each one supports a proven retailing concept. So what happens when it is time to grow your online business? If you've defined the next step, and are attempting to grow to it, you must already have some sort of strategic plan in mind. Whatever the experts say about this being the crucial factor, you'll never get there without sufficient resources. If these aren't in place, you'll need to get creative and hit upon new backers from somewhere before moving forward. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You will hear a student, Hannah Jordan, giving a short talk on the topic of soil. For questions 7 to 15, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part 2. I'm going to be giving a short talk on soil. I've tried to summarise some of the main information I found on the topic. The advantage for me is that there's a great deal of research on soil. The research often looks at one particular function that soil provides. One Canadian study I looked at focused on the importance of soil as a building material used ever since humans first settled in communities. All studies emphasise its importance as a key to global well-being. In today's world, there's a huge amount of pressure put on how we use our soil and why we're using it. This is due to the very basic fact that the world population is rising rapidly. 
We need to look after our soil and natural habitats because the very survival of humankind may be at stake otherwise. And wherever we have people, we have waste. A significant amount of waste is put into landfill sites. The consequences have been serious in terms of soil pollution. Once pollutants find their way into the food chain, they can damage the land and the health of any vegetation or people in the area. Dispersal of this waste through the soil also changes the composition of the soil and its ability to perform many of the functions that people and plants rely on. For example, I have seen respected data that prove that some forms of soil pollution drastically diminish the total of microbes and this in turn decreases the biotic capability of the soil. There are both inorganic and organic pollutants. Some of the main toxic substances are inorganic and occur as a result of mining in most continents of the world, notably the Americas, Europe and Asia. Secondary causes are smelting and the spreading of sewage on the land. In the past, it may have been ignorance or a couldn't-care-less attitude which resulted in so much damage. Organic pollutants often take the form of pesticides. It's now appreciated that some of the early insecticides, such as DDT, had a considerable impact on the environment. An area I find fascinating is the potential of organic-based pollutants to disrupt our hormones, which can have serious consequences over generations. Many of you will know quite a bit about the effects of acid rain. This phenomenon has been with us ever since countries became industrialised and began burning fossil fuels. Then came the car, emitting its exhaust fumes into the atmosphere. However, not all the causes of acid rain are man-made. Volcanoes release significant quantities of harmful gases into the atmosphere too, which then get into the soil through acid rain. In addition to acid rain, I've also looked at soil erosion. There are two main causes of soil erosion, water and wind, and it's the latter which seems to have caught the attention of the press. It's soil erosion caused by water that's more widespread and can have more devastating effects. But soil is not only being eroded by the elements, it's also becoming weaker in terms of organic matter, which means crops aren't grown in rich soil anymore. This is a result of the way we farm. As agriculturalists turn to intensive farming, this is a system which results in topsoil becoming weaker. Moreover, in recent years, because of the demand for increased crop production, cultivation has been extended more and more to sloping fields, and when it rains, a small rill becomes... A Now you will hear part two again. I'm going to be giving a short talk on soil. I've tried to summarise some of the main information I found on the topic. The advantage for me is that there's a great deal of research on soil. The research often looks at one particular function that soil provides. One Canadian study I looked at focused on the importance of soil as a building material used ever since humans first settled in communities. All studies emphasise its importance as a key to global well-being. In today's world, there's a huge amount of pressure put on how we use our soil and why we're using it. This is due to the very basic fact that the world population is rising rapidly. We need to look after our soil and natural habitats because the very survival of humankind may be at stake otherwise. And wherever we have people, we have waste. A significant amount of waste is put into landfill sites. The consequences have been serious in terms of soil pollution. Once pollutants find their way into the food chain, they can damage the land and the health of any vegetation or people in the area. Dispersal of this waste through the soil also changes the composition of the soil and its ability to perform many of the functions that people and plants rely on. 
For example, I have seen respected data that prove that some forms of soil pollution drastically diminish the total of microbes, and this in turn decreases the biotic capability of the soil. There are both inorganic and organic pollutants. Some of the main toxic substances are inorganic and occur as a result of mining in most continents of the world, notably the Americas, Europe and Asia. Secondary causes are smelting and the spreading of sewage on the land. In the past, it may have been ignorance or a couldn't-care-less attitude which resulted in so much damage. Organic pollutants often take the form of pesticides. It's now appreciated that some of the early insecticides, such as DDT, had a considerable impact on the environment. An area I find fascinating is the potential of organic-based pollutants to disrupt our hormones, which can have serious consequences over generations. Many of you will know quite a bit about the effects of acid rain. This phenomenon has been with us ever since countries became industrialised and began burning fossil fuels. Then came the car, emitting its exhaust fumes into the atmosphere. However, not all the causes of acid rain are man-made. Volcanoes release significant quantities of harmful gases into the atmosphere too, which then get into the soil through acid rain. In addition to acid rain, I've also looked at soil erosion. There are two main causes of soil erosion, water and wind, and it's the latter which seems to have caught the attention of the press. It's soil erosion caused by water that's more widespread and can have more devastating effects. But soil is not only being eroded by the elements, it's also becoming weaker in terms of organic matter, which means crops aren't grown in rich soil anymore. This is a result of the way we farm. As agriculturalists turn to intensive farming, this is a system which results in topsoil becoming weaker. Moreover, in recent years, because of the demand for increased crop production, cultivation has been extended more and more to sloping fields, and when it rains, a small rill becomes... That is the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear part of a discussion programme in which a teacher called Simon and a business journalist called Trina are talking about the issue of change. For questions 16 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have one minute in which to look at part three. If I could just come in here, Simon, I mean, there are loads of expressions in most languages to the effect that change is a good thing. In English, for example, someone who doesn't embrace change is said to be stuck in his ways. If we're tired of being indoors or watching TV, we say we need a change of scenery. Then there's a proverb which goes, a change is as good as a rest. So all these are positive views of change, promoting change as something which suggests a whole host of worthy experiences to do with newness, difference, the excitement of the unknown, the adventure of the unpredictable. True, Trina, but there's also a saying, don't fix it if it ain't broke. 
And there's another which is change for change's sake. So this is the other side of the coin. And these are expressions which represent change as something threatening because they disturb the existing equilibrium. And I could quite easily feel both of these contrasting sentiments at different times. Oh, what about change in the business world? I think anyone who fails to move with the times, update and adjust is doomed because otherwise the product or service in question will no longer be relevant as time moves on. It's even a requirement of high-level jobs specified in management contracts. It's taken as read that you have to embrace change and you're a fool if you don't. It's not even on the discussion table. The result, in practice, can be quite bewildering, with constantly shifting goals and policies and an obsession with rebranding and changing names for everything. But in many companies, it's tantamount to high treason to express a dissenting voice of conservatism or to be seen to be putting a spanner in the works. Change is a given. Actually, that puts me in mind of something that's evident in all walks of life, even education, and that's feedback forms. There's a bit of an obsession with being customer-led and constantly asking for customer feedback in the form of questionnaires. Yes, you find it in libraries, museums and schools. And it leads to a situation where the tail wags the dog. One person's sheet says, I didn't like X and argues the case well, and this view is seized upon in a knee-jerk response, regardless of whether it's actually a representative comment of the larger sample, and a whole system gets changed unnecessarily. Well, I guess if you invite people to make comments about potential changes, they'll think of anything that comes into their heads and write it, whether or not they're happy with the system that's actually in place. Um, just to change the subject slightly, I was thinking that... Um, Often on a day-to-day -day level, change can be irritating. Things like unexpected roadworks on your journey home from work, or if you normally go swimming on a Wednesday evening at six, and then the pool times change and there's a class on instead at that time, then your routine gets broken. You had a nice little system for a while, and it's really annoying until you find a way around it. And that's typical of change. In the work environment, it's initially a pain for everyone, and no one likes it because they've just got confident in their new routine again following the last changes. But usually people come round to seeing the point of the change, and in due course that change becomes the new accepted status quo, which you don't want to change. <laughs> yes. So does change ultimately lead to happiness? Well, the relationship between change and perceived happiness is also interesting. There's nothing that makes me happier than going out on my bike into the countryside by myself for an hour in the sun. But I know that if I did that day in, day out, I'd soon tire of it. So I guess what I'm saying is an activity like that is mostly enjoyable because most of the time you're stuck in an office. And so this enables you to escape from your stressful working life. If it's no longer a change, then it ceases to be something happy. So, if you look at everything we've said... I Now you will hear part three again. If I could just come in here, Simon. I mean, there are loads of expressions in most languages to the effect that change is a good thing. In English, for example, someone who doesn't embrace change is said to be stuck in his ways. If we're tired of being indoors or watching TV, we say we need a change of scenery. Then there's a proverb which goes, a change is as good as a rest. So all these are positive views of change, promoting change as something which suggests a whole host of worthy experiences to do with newness, difference, the excitement of the unknown, the adventure of the unpredictable. True, Trina, but there's also a saying, don't fix it if it ain't broke. And there's another, which is change for change's sake. So this is the other side of the coin. And these are expressions which represent change as something threatening because they disturb the existing equilibrium. And I could quite easily feel both of these contrasting sentiments at different times. Oh, what about change in the business world? I think anyone who fails to move with the times, update and adjust is doomed because otherwise the product or service in question will no longer be relevant as time moves on. It's even a requirement of high-level jobs specified in management contracts. It's taken as read that you have to embrace change, and you're a fool if you don't. It's not even on the discussion table. 
The result, in practice, can be quite bewildering, with constantly shifting goals and policies and an obsession with rebranding and changing names for everything. But in many companies, it's tantamount to high treason to express a dissenting voice of conservatism, or to be seen to be putting a spanner in the works. Change is a given. Actually, that puts me in mind of something that's evident in all walks of life, even education, and that's feedback forms. There's a bit of an obsession with being customer-led and constantly asking for customer feedback in the form of questionnaires. Yes, you find it in libraries, museums, and schools. And it leads to a situation where the tail wags the dog. One person's sheet says, "I didn't like X," and argues the case well. And this view is seized upon in a knee-jerk response, regardless of whether it's actually a representative comment of the larger sample. And a whole system gets changed unnecessarily. Well, I guess if you invite people to make comments about potential changes, they'll think of anything that comes into their heads and write it, whether or not they're happy with the system that's actually in place.、Um, just to change the subject slightly, I was thinking that.、Um, Often on a day-to-day level, change can be irritating. Things like unexpected roadworks on your journey home from work, or if you normally go swimming on a Wednesday evening at six, and then the pool times change and there's a class on instead at that time, then your routine gets broken. You had a nice little system for a while, and it's really annoying until you find a way around it. And that's typical of change. In the work environment, it's initially a pain for everyone, and no one likes it because they've just got confident in their new routine again, following the last changes. But usually, people come round to seeing the point of the change, and in due course, that change becomes the new accepted status quo, which you don't want to change. <laughs> yes. So, does change ultimately lead to happiness? Well, the relationship between change and perceived happiness is also interesting. There's nothing that makes me happier than going out on my bike into the countryside by myself for an hour in the sun. But I know that if I did that day in day out, I'd soon tire of it. So I guess what I'm saying is, an activity like that is mostly enjoyable because most of the time you're stuck in an office, and so this enables you to escape from your stressful working life. If it's no longer a change, then it ceases to be something happy. So, if you look at everything we've said. I... That is the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You will hear five short extracts. In which people are talking about their involvement in award-winning projects related to the natural world. Look at task one. For questions twenty-one to twenty-five, choose from the list A to H what special feature of the project each speaker mentions. Now look at task two. For questions twenty-six to thirty, choose from the list A to H. What positive effect of receiving the award each speaker appreciated? While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have forty-five seconds in which to look at part four. Speaker one. The project I received the award for was to do with a set of prehistoric animal footprints. I originally found them by chance where a storm had blown the sand off a rocky shelf by the sea, and I knew straight away they'd been made by a species which is now extinct. I was worried the tracks would be destroyed by the fishermen who use the area, but since I've got the award, they realize how important they are. My work involved making casts of the footprints so they could be studied elsewhere, 
and I developed an innovative way of doing this by using silicon rubber, which produces better quality molds than plaster. Speaker 2 Nowadays, biologists have developed all sorts of highly specialised things to attach to animals to record their speed and heart rate and so on. But given the enormous number of animals in need of study in the world, we need to be looking for something that can be used as a powerful cross-species method of logging data. Although my solution is technically complex, it's so simple in concept that I call it my silly idea. The award gave me the financial support I needed to develop this project further and see how it worked with different species. The data it collects will help conservationists understand habitat needs and resolve important conservation questions. Speaker 3 I spend six months a year in Rajasthan in northwest India. They used to have vast camel herds which were used for transportation by the semi-nomadic Reka people there, but disease had decimated the herds and undermined the livelihood of the entire community. I worked with local people to set up a training centre where we developed treatments for camels using tried and tested local herbal treatments, together with modern medicines, Receiving the award was a great acknowledgement of what we'd achieved. It also gave us the backing to get official certification of camel milk as an approved foodstuff, and the Reka people are now marketing this very cost-effective byproduct. Speaker 4 I spent most of my life studying the whale shark. There's so much we don't know about them, and their numbers have fallen to a critical level, so I set up a project to monitor them. I had to find a way of identifying individuals, and that's what I got the award for. With the money, I've been able to recruit research assistants and show them the technique. What it's based on is each shark has a distinctive pattern of spots on its body. So, you analyse that pattern using a technique I adapted from one that was originally used to identify star patterns, and that gives you a unique identification. Speaker 5 I started silkworm farming here in India 20 years ago. I used the usual techniques, but I had a lot of problems, so I changed my approach. I'm convinced of the need to use farming methods which are environmentally benign, and I'm gradually starting to get my ideas across about what I do. That's something the award has given me the confidence to do, communicate my ideas to others. For example, I have mosquito nets to protect the silkworms, and I adapted some Japanese techniques like, instead of traditional trays, I rear the worms in nets. They're easier to keep clean. Now you will hear part four again. Speaker one. The project I received the award for was to do with a set of prehistoric animal footprints. I originally found them by chance where a storm had blown the sand off a rocky shelf by the sea, and I knew straight away they'd been made by a species which is now extinct. I was worried the tracks would be destroyed by the fishermen who used the area, but since I've got the award, they realize how important they are. My work involved making casts of the footprints so they could be studied elsewhere. And I developed an innovative way of doing this by using silicon rubber, which produces better quality molds than plaster. Speaker 2 Nowadays, biologists have developed all sorts of highly specialised things to attach to animals to record their speed and heart rate and so on. But given the enormous number of animals in need of study in the world, we need to be looking for something that can be used as a powerful cross-species method of logging data. Although my solution is technically complex, it's so simple in concept that I call it my silly idea. The award gave me the financial support I needed to develop this project further and see how it worked with different species. The data it collects will help conservationists understand habitat needs and resolve important conservation questions. Speaker 3 I spend six months a year in Rajasthan in northwest India. They used to have vast camel herds which were used for transportation by the semi-nomadic Reka people there, but disease had decimated the herds and undermined the livelihood of the entire community. 
I worked with local people to set up a training centre where we developed treatments for camels using tried and tested local herbal treatments, together with modern medicines. Receiving the award was a great acknowledgement of what we'd achieved. It also gave us the backing to get official certification of camel milk as an approved foodstuff, and the Reka people are now marketing this very cost-effective byproduct. Speaker four. I spent most of my life studying the whale shark. There's so much we don't know about them, and their numbers have fallen to a critical level. So I set up a project to monitor them. I had to find a way of identifying individuals, and that's what I got the award for. With the money, I've been able to recruit research assistants and show them the technique. What it's based on is each shark has a distinctive pattern of spots on its body. So, you analyse that pattern using a technique I adapted from one that was originally used to identify star patterns, and that gives you a unique identification. Speaker five. I started silkworm farming here in India twenty years ago. I used the usual techniques, but I had a lot of problems, so I changed my approach. I'm convinced of the need to use farming methods which are environmentally benign, and I'm gradually starting to get my ideas across about what I do. That's something the award has given me the confidence to do: communicate my ideas to others. For example, I have mosquito nets to protect the silkworms, and I adapted some Japanese techniques. Like instead of traditional trays, I rear the worms in nets. They're easier to keep clean. That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left, so that you are sure to finish in time. <laughs>